بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم طه ما انزلنا عليك القران لتشقى الا تذكره لمن يخشى أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين بعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه وسيد رسله نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Qala Allahul Azim fi kitabihi al kareem wa huwa ahsan al qailin wa astaq al sadaqin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Idh ra'a naran fa qala li ahlihim kuthu inni anastu naran la'alli atikum minha bi qabsin aw ajidu 'ala an nar huda. Falamma ataha nudiya ya Musa inni ana rabbuka fakhla'na 'alayk innaka bil wadi al muqaddas tuwa wa ana akhtartuka. فاستمع لما يوحى إنني أنا الله لا إله إلا أنا فاعبدني وأقم الصلاة لذكري آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم When it comes to the wonderful story of the Prophet of God known as Moses who is revered and highly respected by all Abrahamic faiths we find the description which is scattered around the Holy Quran taking a number of important dimensions into consideration and indeed inviting the believers and others to reflect upon the words of the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in particular with reference to the Prophets. One key message of course is in relation to the idea that an individual when they approach the story and a narrative of a prophet of God should be asking themselves, if, if I was in the position of this individual, how would my reaction be? How would I respond? What would be the outcome when it comes to dealing with such a situation? In particular, Musa السلام, is described in a beautiful manner in the Holy Quran and in chapter 20, Surah Taha, when it comes to the beginning of the announcement and the fact that Musa السلام, receives the revelation for the first time. And we discuss the idea that he approach, is approaching a land known as Tuwa, whereby there is a communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through some kind of a veil, through some kind of a creation of God, as we know that the Almighty does not, of course, himself speak in that particular way that you and I understand using the uh, a sound or so. And we discussed the um, notion behind Musa السلام, being told to remove his shoes or his sandals before this communication can begin. One thing that's left about Ayah 12 is regarding the land, this sacred land known as Tuwa. Question is, where is this land? Um, as the Quran has uh, referred to it as a blessed land. And uh, there are many opinions with regards to the exact location of it. Um, one opinion is that it is found between Syria, modern day Syria, and um, Egypt. So it is on the journey that um, Musa السلام, undertook and therefore it could be located anywhere in that particular area. Um, some of the Mufassireen have come forward and said, well, this land of Tuwa has been mentioned twice in the Quran by name. Chapter 79, verse number 16, Allah wa ta'ala refers to Tuwa again. And they say the reason why um, the name is referred to as this Tuwa comes from the fact that it has been praised in two occasions in the Quran. So here in chapter 20, it's referred to as the Wadil Muqaddas, the valley which is sacred. And in 
Suratul Qasas, verse number 30, it's referred to as Al Buqatul Mubaraka, without reference to the name itself, Tuwa, but it's given the title Mubaraka, which has this Baraka blessing, and the fact that it's sacred. So the fact that it's been praised twice is an indication of its significance and importance and therefore some people say that is what it means by tuwa. Tuwa comes from the idea that it's something that is somehow being expressed or given an indication of its significance on two occasions. Others have said tuwa means ihata which means it has been encompassed by God's mercy and blessings. Why is it uh, uh, sacred? Of course, because of the fact that Musa السلام, communicated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that area. And therefore the sacredness comes from the action or the event that took place. The Mufassirin also have given the uh, possibility that it comes from Tayy uh, al-Ard. Tayy al-Ard is a phenomena that we have in the world of hadith, which essentially means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shortens the distance that is about to be traveled by an individual miraculously. And it's like the earth being folded. And so this particular uh, distance that Musa alayhi was walking or traveling from Madian towards Egypt was somehow shortened for the Prophet of God this Kalimullah, Moses, Musa alayhi salam. And therefore, there is a suggestion that, look, this land is something not only that's blessed, but it's also one that has been, the distance has been uh, shortened for you. The Quran, of course, in, tells us about the conversation and the communication that took place thereafter. 13 verses of the Quran is specifically focused on the particular conversation that took place between Musa alayhi or rather 11 in, 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 in reference to this conversation. And the continuation is with regards to the selection of Musa alayhi salam as the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, the ayah number 13 says, وَأَنَ اخْتَرْتُكَ فَاسْتَمِعْ لِمَا يُوحَى I have chosen you, therefore listen quite attentively and carefully. The first realization that emerges from this verse is the fact that selection is from God, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no doubt. Here he says, أَنَ اخْتَرْتُكَ I have chosen you. And when there is a selection process, that means there are options available. If there were no options, there won't be selection. It would simply be A, B, C, they have to take that responsibility. Therefore, when Allah wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَ اخْتَرْتُكَ First of all, أَنَا Referring to الذات المقدسة, the uh, uh, the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Taala, His Sacred Divine Essence, that I have indeed selected you. Therefore, pay attention and listen to what is about to be told to you. It is truly a magnificent uh, feeling to be told by Allah that I have chosen you. You know, sometimes if you respect someone in the community, could it could be a person of responsibility, a person of um, some kind of uh, uh, following, and they give you a task, or they may tell you that out of people I have selected you, you feel good about yourself. You feel, wow, you know, out of everyone I have been chosen. In fact, to a smaller scale, most of us have felt that when we're at school, and the teacher wants to give us a task, or wants to make um, one of the students perform a particular task and they often choose a good student to do that. Yes, and they feel privileged. It's a sense of honor and pride that they have been selected out of the, uh, the, the rest of the uh, potentials and the people that are indeed there. The key thing though at, the, at this particular juncture is the fact that Allah Taala here is illustrating the importance of the selection by the, uh, the Almighty when it comes to divine responsibilities. So prophethood, and as the school of Ahlul Bayt believes, imama, 
the natural continuation of prophethood is all through divine selection. وَأَنَا اخْتَرْتُكَ I have chosen you. And you look at the verses in the Holy Quran that uh, talk about this and you can see a close correlation between this selection by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the divine responsibility. And these are known as ayatul ja'al, the ayat of the placing. Like for instance, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, inni ja'iluka fil ardi, aw inni ja'iluka lin nasi imama. When it comes to the conversation with Ibrahim alayhi salam, there is the ja'al, I am placing you, I am making you an imam for the people. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا وَجَعَلْنَا means we have selected, we have chosen from amongst them imams that guide through our command, yes? إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً So these are known as ayatul ja'al. There's always this a reference to the placing and the selection of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala for certain individuals. And it does indeed make sense. Today, if we had to place somebody to perform a certain task, we choose the best, uh, whom we believe is more equipped with the skills necessary to undertake a task in the best possible manner, that we find it satisfactory. Therefore, we'll go through a selection process, we'll try and uh, find the best matched candidate. And this is in line with intellectual, rational thinking, and therefore, when it comes to these responsibilities, which are the most, when it comes to guiding mankind towards the path of righteousness, the truth, it needs to be, um, first of all, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows his creation, we can't say better than others, because that's comparing Allah with human beings, yes? Who knows, who's the only one who knows his creation. That's what we can say, yeah? and would, make, would want to make sure that the message is delivered in the most effective way possible, and therefore it is he who chooses. Why am I, descri why am I pointing a lot of, placing a lot of emphasis on this? Because of the whole discussion about imama and what happened after the Holy Prophet, and was there some kind of a divine selection, or was there an election? Even the election was flawed in that it did not involve the majority of the Muslims, only a few who decided to elect or choose amongst them a caliph to continue and lead the Muslim Ummah after the Holy Prophet. The notion here is Musa السلام, is chosen. Why was he chosen? And there are indications in the world of hadith about some of the attributes and the characteristics that Musa السلام, enjoyed. We have a hadith that says that Allah Taala spoke to Musa and says, Oh Musa, do you know why I chose you? And Musa السلام, says, Oh Lord, I don't know. And the hadith says, Because one of your habits is that you used to humble yourself before Allah by placing your cheeks on the ground. This uh, uh, hadith that we have for Imam al-Askari the signs of the believers are five, yes? Al-jahar bi bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ziyarat al-arba'een, attakhattum bil yameen. One of them is ta'fir al-jabeen. Ta'fir, jabeen is this, the forehead. Ta'fir means placing it on the ground, or what comes from the ground. Yes, according to the rulings, yes? So the key thing is, Musa السلام, is described in hadith literature as an individual who demonstrated and exhibited tawadu, humility, humbleness before the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why you find, and perhaps many of the brothers and sisters have come across the narration that says that Musa was tested on a number of occasions to illustrate to people his degree of humility when the Almighty would task him with the responsibility of finding somebody whom Musa would consider to be better than them. So Allah would say, go and find me a creation of mine. And Musa would not find a human being and eventually he would come across a dog who perhaps either is dead or suffering with an illness or leprosy or whatever. And for a moment would think that maybe I am better positioned than that, than that animal. But besides 
ultimately when conversing with the Almighty to say that I have not found any creation of yours which I consider to be better. And the response, according to hadith, is that Allah would say to him, O oh Musa, if you had told me that you are better than that dog, I would not have given you prophethood. To that extent of the need for the heart to be so submissive and so pure and so humble for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why al nabi al-A'zam wa Rasul al-Akram Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Would mention, would say to the companions according to the hadith, ما لي لا أرى في وجوهكم علامة الإيمان. Why is it that I don't see on your faces the sign of belief? The sign, alama, it's singular. So they would say, Ya Rasulullah, wa ma alamatul iman. What is the, the main demonstrating factor for belief? They would say, at tawadah, humbleness. Because the first act of disobedience of God was due to arrogance. Yes? When, when shaitan would say to the Almighty, Ana khayrun min, three destructive words, I am better than he. خلقتني من نار وخلقته من طين. I have been created from smokeless fire and Adam from clay. And somehow, in the logic of shaitan, fire is better than clay. But it was destructive and it was the first act of disobedience. And therefore you find that in the religion of Islam, many acts of worship are what are associated with tawaba, hajj. Look at hajj. Everyone, irrespective of your background, irrespective of your uh, uh, status in society, how much you own, yes, you wear the same things. You wear the same things. You look at, for instance, of course, salah. Yes, this act of placing the forehead onto the ground is for everyone. And it's considered to be the greatest part of prayers. Sujood, sajda is the greatest part. The individuals will come to the Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, we do everything that you say. We won't drink alcohol, we won't uh, womanize, we won't do this, this. But in prayers, Excuse us from placing our ground onto the of our forehead onto the ground. We can't do it. And the Prophet would say, "That's not. That, I'm not looking for that. I'm not interested in that. It's a complete package. Yes. And that's why you find in salah that's the case. In fasting, in the holy month of Ramadan, once again, an individual does what? Abstains from food and drink to humble themselves, even though they may have the whole world supply. They can't eat." to sh break the shackles and the chains of materialism and egocentric th uh, thinking and temptations. Yeah? So the, 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 uh, the focus when it comes to many of the acts of worship, including zakat and khums as well, is to give. Yes, and to give and to uh, release and to detach. Yes? And this all leads to the humility of the heart and the act of uh, tawadah, which is so strongly encouraged in um, teachings. There was a, a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Muslim, a great scholar and a companion of the fifth and the sixth Imam, Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. And this individual happened to come from a fairly affluent family. So he was quite well off and uh, one day, Imam, one of the Imams, either the Imam Baqir or Sadiq, saw Muhammad ibn Muslim in the mosque and comes to him and says, Ya Muhammad, tawadha lillah. He saw signs of arrogance. History or narrations don't tell us what he did in terms of demonstrating this. But it must then have not been something quite apparent. Only the Imam sensed it. Tawadha lillah. So what did he do? Muhammad ibn Muslim. These are greats, you know. They just need an indication from the Imams and they will do whatever is necessary to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next day, he's sitting next to the mosque, entrance of the mosque, and selling dates. It's like with the small dates, saying like that. You know, people coming to the mosque, taking a date and giving him a bit of money. 
So his family, his tribe, his community came to him and said, you know, save a bit of, you know, our pride. What are you doing? You know, if it's money, we've got money. If it's, why are you doing this? He said, Sayyidi Mawla, Imam Sadiq al Baqir told me, I must do things which will what? Encourage humility. I sell this because so that I don't think I'm so important. You know, I would sit, sit next to the entrance of the mosque and sell things to people. You know, not that, you know, I feel that I'm somebody, or I'm a great individual. And, you know, the Ahl al-Bayt, alayhi as, as, as the uh, chosen people of the Almighty, subhanahu wa ta'ala, demonstrated this in many shapes and forms. We have the, the narrations that, for instance, one day an individual was traveling for Hajj in a group or as the caravan, and he said there was a, a person who was always ensuring that others ate before him. They would be served. He was serving all the time. And I loved him. I loved this person. I never knew who he was. Until one day, I asked someone. I said, you know this person? Because back in the time, they used to travel. Hajj would take months. Sometimes weeks if you're in Medina and so on. But he said he would, it would, it, he would be continuously serving us. So I asked, who is this man that all wants to do is serve others rather than be served? I was told he's the grandson of the Holy Prophet Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin. He said, I was amazed. Grandson of the Prophet, the son of the third Imam, Sayyid al Shuhada, serving. I went to him and said, My master, how is it that you're doing this? He said, Now that you have identified who I am and you know that I'm doing this, I have to leave. I will go with another group, a caravan, so that I continue. So that he continues serving. And these are one of the beautiful, great uh, qualities of an individual who considers themselves a mutawadah, who loves to serve much more than being served. Yes? And that's a, a drive within them to do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, Musa alayhi salam, one of the key things was that he demonstrated humility in particular when it comes to sujood, in particular when it comes to Prostration, prolonging a prostration. And uh, we are told that there was a, 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 an individual who served the Prophet for many years and came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, I would like to continue serving you. And the Prophet said, you have served me so many years. I would like to reward you for this service. What would you like? You know, what would you like me to give you? And an individual who does not think materialism would say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, let me think about it. An individual who's thinking this world would say, Ya Rasulullah, can you give me this amount of money and this place or this house and sort me out with this person and so on and so forth, yes? This person would say, Ya Rasulullah, give me a chance to think about it. He comes back and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I want to be one thing I need from you. I want to be with you in Jannah. That's all. That's all I want. And by the way, there is absolutely nothing better than this. In this world and Akhirah, he could not have said anything better than this. Tell me, is there anything better than being with the Prophet, which is the highest degree with the Imams and the Prophet, highest degree in paradise? The Prophet didn't say to him, I'm sorry, who are you and who is me? You know, I don't think that's going to happen. Can you ask for a second request? The Prophet didn't say that. The Prophet beautifully responded to him and said, that's fine. But you've got to help me. And in order for you to reach that level, you need to prolong your prostration. You need to prolong your sajda in order for that dua to be accepted. So sajda indeed is, uh, is one of the closest positions that the human being can have with their, own, with their creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it has a very beautiful status in Islamic spirituality and in the teachings of the religion in general. Ayah number 14, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says, Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'abudni. First emphasis here, after telling Musa, you have to listen. فَاسْتَمِعْ لِمَا yuha. Was Musa not willing to listen? No. Musa, I mean, the key thing here, I, I, I came across a beautiful narration, and maybe if you can remember this narration, 
on approximately 18th of June. Why 18th of June? The beginning of the month of Ramadan, approximately. Why? Because we are told in a narration that one day an individual saw Imam Sadiq in the heat of the summer in Medina during the month of Ramadan working and sweating profusely. So they come to him and say, Yabna Rasulillah, it's hot, it's the summer, and you're fasting. Aren't you tired? We could see that you're continuing, you know, and it doesn't seem to be impacting you as much. And uh, Imam alayhi salam, the beautiful uh, response that he uh, gave to that individual, he says, لَذَّةٌ nida أَنْسَانِ taab." The beauty of the call made me forget the tiredness and the exhaustion. Which call? Which call? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he has communicated with Musa, has also communicated with us. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as-siyam, kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. Imam al-Sadiq would say, this Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, it's a great honor. Allah has chosen us and has given us that responsibility, isn't it? He has selected us and now he is addressing us. Not everyone, all you who believe, Fasting has been made obligatory for you. So what does the Imam say? Imam says the sweetness of the call from Allah has made me forget the exhaustion. Yes, because I know it's coming from him. I know there's a special beauty about it. It's not a normal direction. It's not a normal conversation. It's from the Creator. And therefore, Musa alayhi salam, when Allah says, فَاسْتَمِعْ لِوْ يَا يُوحَى What does that mean? Allah is saying, understand, who is it that's conversing with you here? This is a very significant event. And it's probably also relevant to us because the Qur'an says, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ فَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِطُوا Yes, that the istima' to the Holy Qur'an is crucial. When the Qur'an is being played, when the Qur'an is being recited, yes? When we are reciting the Qur'an, there is a need for us to listen attentively. This is not a novel, this is not a historical work, yes? It's not a normal text. These are uh, miraculous words of the Almighty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Innani an Allah. This is the first tenant or the declaration of what? Of Tawheed. Monotheism. And... لا إله إلا أنا فاعبدني. This عبادة the مفسرين say is what ثمرة التوحيد. So Allah says, I am Allah. There is no Lord except me. Therefore worship me. They say this worship therefore is the fruit of what monotheism of توحيد. Earlier on. Two verses before, it says, Inni ana rabbuk. Here it says, Innani ana Allah. Why did Allah use rabbuk at the beginning and Allah now? And by the way, there's also emphasis here, just like it was two verses earlier. In verse 12, Inni ana, these are tools for emphasis. Yes. Here also, Innani ana, to definitely confirm without a shadow of a doubt that it's the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala what communicating with Musa alayhi salam. But the question is why was the word Rabbuk used earlier and now Allah used? Mufassirin say Rabbuk denotes Lord and Lordship and it reflects the companionship or compassionate nature of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and he wanted Musa to be at ease. Now it's the beginning of the what? Of the real declaration. Now it's about the Tawheed. Now it's about affirming the tenet of monotheism. Innani and Allah. Musa is settled now. Musa knows what's going on. Allah has told him, listen to what I'm about to say. 
This is therefore a declaration of monotheism. Now, you look at the verses, you find that 13, 14, and 15 summarize Usuluddin. In addition to some important elements of Furu' al-Din. So you look at the three verses. Anakhtartuka is prophethood. Yes. Innani anallah. That's Tawheed. And the final one, inna sa'ata atiya. The day of judgment is coming. That's in reference to the day of judgment. Of course, the school of Ahlul Bayt believes that uh, the tenets and the principles of religion is five. But the two, the justice and imama, they are derivatives or they are somehow uh, extracted from Tawheed. So um, uh, Adala, the justice of God, is from the belief in Tawheed and imama is from prophethood. But it's beautiful that in three verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established this quite clearly. But the key thing also for us to understand here is this. Allah wa ta'ala hasn't said to Musa, Oh Musa, the mission is to tell people about this belief. Immediately he's put action next to it. La ilaha illa ana fa'budni. And why is this important? Because from time to time, and perhaps in this day and age, we're also being faced with similar challenges. You have people who come forward with their own understanding of religion and they say, you know what, it's in the heart. That's where it matters. It's there. You know, you speak to, with all respect, to brothers who don't pray and sisters who don't pray, sisters who don't wear hijab, and you say, why is it you don't do it? You say, well, brother, you don't know. I believe in it. It's in my heart. You know, one of the brothers said something with regards to uh, this. I'm not sure I agree with him, but it's, it's interesting. He said, you know, when somebody says this, that my heart believes in it, Say, okay, no problem. Allah on the Day of Judgment will take out your heart and take it to Jannah. <laughs> and the rest, God help you. Yes, your heart believes in it, number one. Number two, has any one of us has the ability to somehow scrutinize our own hearts? Do we have a machine that gives us a reading? Yes, the heart believes in hijab. Yes, the heart believes in khums and zakat and in taqlid and in marja'iyya. Yes, the heart believes. It's deception. Yeah, it's there, but when I'm comfortable, when I'm ready, I will practice it. Islam is not about theory, it's also about practice. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Innani anallahu la ilaha illa ana fa'budni. Fa'budni, the fa is immediately linked to the statement of Tawheed. There's no gaps, there's no ifs and buts. Actions must be incorporated with beliefs. It's not sufficient for an individual to say, I believe. It's a simple conclusion in the Holy Quran. It's not very complicated. That actions must be incorporated with belief. Now, this kalima, la ilaha illallah. Of course, here it's innani anallahu la ilaha illa ana. But in the Holy Quran, of course, we have the kalima, this uh, initiation of the shahada in which an individual who is not a Muslim enters into the realms of the religion, you'll find that La ilaha illallah, as this kalima is called, is mentioned twice in the Holy Quran. La ilaha illa huwa is mentioned 30 times in the Quran. La ilaha illa ana, as in Surah Taha, mentioned three times. And La ilaha illa ant is mentioned once. Okay? It's very interesting, and I'm, uh, you know, once you look at the, uh, in conclusion though, I mean, of course, there is this emphasis on this particular declaration of the unity and the oneness and the sublime uh, essence of the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We are told that La ilaha illallah is Sayyidul Adhkar, the principle of all types of Remembrance. The hadith would say, Afdalul A'mal. I found narrations that says, Afdalul A'mal, Qawlu la ilaha illallah. The best of deeds. Astaqul Aqwal. The most truthful of statements. Miftahul Samawat. Shi'arul Muslimin ala sirat. These are all from ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt. They say the 
declaration of the Muslims on the path, on the bridge, on the day of judgment, is La ilaha illallah. Can you imagine? They say La ilaha illallah and they walk towards paradise. As we know, this bridge somehow takes the individual towards the lofty uh, paradise. And therefore, it is quite significant, of course, no doubt, and it is highly emphasized. Look at the narrations that talk about it. For instance, we have the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and his holy progeny. The hadith says, مَا مِنَ الْكَلَامِ كَلِمَةٌ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ مِنْ قَوْلِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ there is nothing from the speech of people more beloved to Allah than when an individual says La ilaha illallah. وَمَا مِنْ عَبْدٍ يَقُولُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَمُدُّ بِهَا صوته. There is no servant of God who says La ilaha إِلَّا اللَّهِ whilst prolonging it slightly. Yes. إِلَّا تَنَاثَرَ الذُّنُوبُهُ تَحْتَ قَدَمَيْهِ what happens is after they say it, their sins will fall under their feet. Kama yatanathar waraku shajar. Just like how the leaves fall from the tree. Their sins fall. This is in Thawab al A'mal and Kitab al Tawheed, Shaykh al Saduq. Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam narration. Man qala la ilaha illa Allah mukhlisan falahu al jannah. Whomsoever says la ilaha illa Allah with sincerity. Has paradise. And then he says, وَإِخْلَاصُهُ What does this sincerity mean? Yes, that La ilaha illallah stops them from the committing of sins. It acts as a what? As a protection, as a fortress for them. In Wasail al Shia and also in Al Kafi, we have this narration from the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. Al Istighfar wa qawlu la ilaha illallah khayrul ibadah. The best form of worship is to say la ilaha illallah and to seek forgiveness. And then he re recites the ayah in the Quran. Fa'alam annahu la ilaha illallah wa staghfir li dhanbik. Verse in the Quran that says, Know that there is no Lord except Allah, there is no deity of worship except Allah, and seek forgiveness for your sins. The Prophet of Islam says, Inna la ilaha illallah unsul mu'min fi hayatih. La ilaha illallah is the sweet companion of the believer in their lives. And when they die, and when they're resurrected. Because we believe there's a, an important segment of Islamic eschatology, that means in the study of the hereafter, that our actions, our deeds have a reality which will be incorporated somehow in the metaphysical world. So every deed that we and I perform and practice, we will be able to see. And this is quite, quite clearly in the Holy Quran, yes? This manifestations of the actions that will be visible for you and I, so it's not necessarily a book of deeds that will be read, but rather us witnessing our own deeds and actions, yes, is supported in the Quran and Hadith. And of course, this is one of them that the kalima of La ilaha illallah is something which will be a close, loving, kind, supportive, companion for the human being. Of course, we have this hadith which is known as as silsilatul dhahabiyya the golden chain uh, in which Imam al-Rada would reach the area of Nishapur and he would say, Kalimatu la ilaha illallahu hisni faman dakhala hisni amina min adabi. The word la ilaha illallah is my fortress. Whoever enters it is safeguarded from my punishment, of course. Oh. بشرطها وشروطها وأنا من شروطها that imama and the wilaya as is clearly demonstrated in the Holy Quran is one of the important conditions for um, the uh, acceptance so to speak and the fulfillment of monotheism and tawheed in the practice of the human being. One dua that is highly recommended to be recited especially when we visit the cemeteries and uh, we visit the uh, graveyards or when we remember the people who have passed away 
It's this dua which is narrated from Amir al Mu'mineen, peace and blessings be upon him. It says, Assalamu ala ahli la ilaha illallah, min ahli la ilaha illallah, ya ahli la ilaha illallah, bihaqqi la ilaha illallah, kayfa wajattum qawla la ilaha illallah, min la ilaha illallah, ya la ilaha illallah, bihaqqi la ilaha illallah, اغفر لمن قال لا إله إلا الله وحشرنا في زمرة من قال لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله وعلي ولي الله. This is the hadith which says, Oh the people of لا إله إلا الله. How did you find the statement of لا إله إلا الله? We are also the people of لا إله إلا الله. Yes, we ask Allah in the through the name of لا إله إلا الله. Yes. To make you of the true people of La ilaha illallah and to resurrect you with the ones who said La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Ali and Waliullah, which highlights what the profound nature and the reward that is reserved for individuals who take this particular statement quite um, uh, 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 as, as an important uh, declaration of their faith. But the question is, of course, why? Is there this need or this requirement, as the Quran says, for there to be a demonstration of La ilaha illallah in action? In other words, Fa'abudni. Why worship me? And if you were to ask with, uh, unfortunately, with near certainty, most of the Muslim Ummah, perhaps a wide uh, variety, a range of the Muslim Ummah, and you ask them, why do we worship? Here Allah says, Fa'budni. Musa, not only should you be propagating and disseminating the message of the unity of God, but you must also worship God exclusively. But why? The response would be normally is what God says. Isn't it? And people say, okay, well, what's your proof in the Quran? They would say, famous ayah. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created human beings as well as the jinn kind except to worship me. So he said, God says we have to worship, therefore we have to worship. The slight challenging aspect behind that deduction is the following. Non-believers would say, this God of yours that you are worshipping, you are giving an indication that he needs your worship. Because you're saying to us that we have to worship because he said we have to worship. Therefore we worship because he told us. End of. Yes? They may get the impression that it's what? It's about a group of individuals created, told, worship. That's it. And they worship. Yes? Just like how individuals like Fir'aun and others, tyrants, felt the need to subject their people to slavery and to consider them as objects of worship because they want to be in control, they want to feel dominance, they, were they want to feel a sense of power. So therefore worship me. So the notion that we pre pre presented to individuals is such. That's why it's so important to not to look at the Holy Qur'an just simply by passing, but to reflect and also to seek guidance from the beautiful teachings of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum We mentioned this. The idea is, and I would like your attention just for a few moments before we end, because this is a very delicate, I know it's not an easy uh, subject to grasp, but it is crucial for our understanding and even when we approach ibadah. Because you see, one of the problem is, psychologists today say, they say human beings do things better when they believe in its necessity and they can see the need to, to do it. So you know, one of the, today if they study these, uh, these kind of behavior of employees in workplaces, why are they not very productive? Why are they not efficient? Because it's become like a very laborious process. Oh, I've just come there, nine to five, I have to work. There's no enthusiasm, there's no encouragement. You know, people just go there for the sake of earning and living and so on. But once you get them excited about what they're doing, when well, there's passion in it, 
once they feel they absolutely love doing it and it's important for them to do it, not just because it's paying the bills, but it's part and parcel of their existence, so to speak, you'll see a totally different mindset. Yes, totally different mentality. They come earlier, they stay a bit longer, they don't waste time, they want to give 100%. And that's why when we stand before Allah in Salah, when it comes to Hajj, when it comes to month of Ramadan, Allahu Akbar, when it comes to the time of Khums, the first number to be called, the Sheikh or Sayyid, Mawlana, is there a way out of this? I can't do it. Why? Because it's a chore. I have to do it, there I do it, I do it. Month of Ramadan, my God, is there a cheap ticket to Australia? People say, because in this year, month of Ramadan, Australia, five o'clock is iftar. Don't get ideas, but that's what it is. Yes? So the people are thinking, I want to escape. I want to be able to do it in a, you know, there's always this. Why? Because the essence of ibadah has not been understood. The essence of ibadah has been neglected. And this is applicable to all things that we do in the name of the religion, hijab, when it comes to uh, obedience of God, when it comes to doing our duties and responsibilities, and so on and so forth, it becomes superficial. Now, very, very briefly, the notion is presented that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you and I, and human beings in general, for one purpose, and that's paradise. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala has created us for Jannah, and at the same time, we have to earn. So it comes through a struggle. It comes through examinations, trials, and hardship. Number one, yes? Number two, in order to reach that level of perfection in this world, whereby we can attain paradise in the hereafter, we need to be helped because we don't know how to do it. Therefore, we need guidance. We need direction. Where does this guidance and direction come from? Prophets. Divine books. Yes? They tell us how we should lead our lives in order to attain Jannah. That's ultimately the purpose, yes? Number three, the tool in order to get to that level can only be achieved through ibadah. Notice the word tool, the means. There are a few important ayat in the Quran as well as narrations which highlight to us that ibadah is not the goal, is the means. Because most people understand it as the goal. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, I have created human beings and the jinn except to worship me, except here means except to use the ibadah to get close to me and ultimately to get salvation for themselves. It's for their own benefit. These are the tools they need. I have, out of my, Allah says, out of His mercy, He has given us what we need to reach that level of virtue, perfection, righteousness. Yes? Number one. Therefore, ibadah becomes a way, the main way, the only way, rather, the only way in which we can attain the satisfaction of God, righteousness, and perfection, and virtue in order to attain the ultimate goal, which is salvation, jannah, paradise. Number one. Number two, the Quran says human beings have been what? Have been created with the intrinsic need to worship. It's there in our own fitrah. We have the desire to worship God. It's there. It's, it's like we have been programmed. That's why we find throughout history all kinds of different people worshipping all kinds of different things. From the worship of the sun to the worship of animals, to worship of human beings, yes? All kinds of different objects of ibadah. Ibadah in Arabic means total obedience. Total obedience. Atta'atul mutlaqa. Total obedience. That's why the Quran says, Alam a'had ilaykum ya bani adama an la ta'budu shaytan. Did I not take an oath covenant from you, O Bani Adam? You should not be worshipping the shaitan. Not many worship the shaitan. Some do, but not many. They are a small percentage of the history of mankind who consider the devil to be an object of worship. But Allah is saying obedience to shaitan. 
Shaitan becomes the Lord. Sometimes the nafs becomes the Lord. The hawa, the drive, the desire of the human being becomes the Lord. Man ittakhadha ilahahu hawa. The hawa becomes the Lord, yes? The emphasis is that ibadah is needed. How is it needed? Three points I mentioned very, very quickly. Number one, human beings in general are insecure beings. They suffer with fear. There's a lot of apprehension. Why? Because of the uncertainty, the unknowns. We're always not sure what's going to happen. We're always uncertain and looking behind our shoulders, yes? And Allah says, this is the greatest problem and greatest challenge that human beings face. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, we will test you with what? Number one, fear. Fear. In a society where there's no security, you can't do anything. Even if you have the wealthiest of people. If you have, even if you have the world's most richest resources, you cannot do a thing. If there is fear, if there's violence, if there's aggression, security. The human being craves, desires, and yearns to be protected and to feel secure. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no one can attain complete security except the worshippers. The Quran says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ هَلُوعًا إِذَا مَسَّهُ الْشَرُّ Allah says, you know, human beings are very hasty. They either hold back, you know, when they're very uh, um, well off, or they panic when they're in a difficult situation. The sense of security that's given, here salah is given as an example of, prayer, of ibadah. That ibadah gives that sense of tranquility that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can fulfill that much needed security for the human being. When we say security, it means what? It's not necessarily we're talking about the physical security. It's about the survival of the human being and the recognition that whatever happens, happens. But as long as they're on the right path, that in itself is sufficient for them. That's why you find these great scholars and of course above them the imams and the prophets in difficult times in times where there is a lot of fear they don't have that much fear of the people Allah says those who are close to God they don't suffer with either fear or anxiety because they've associated themselves so much with the divine that they know everything is according to a plan. Whatever happens, happens. And therefore they have what? They have submitted, number one. Number two, why we need ibadah? Because intrinsically human beings have the desire to converse. They have to speak. They'll go mad if they don't speak, you know? Place a human being in the desert with no one else and they go crazy. They need to empty out their hearts. They need to communicate, and therefore what happens? The vast majority of the people communicate with their fellow human beings, which isn't a problem. But when it comes to seeking assistance and help, which is why most of us communicate, or why won't most of us open up our hearts, people's dependency is normally upon others, other human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I am the source of your healing. I can make the difference for you. I can make it happen for you. Speak to me. How do you speak to Allah? Ibadah. How do you converse with Allah? Ibadah. Dua, salah, munajat. It's all form of ibadah. Allah says, I have created you with the need to empty out your heart. You know, they have this in Christian belief. They have this, you know, when you sit next to a, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, a priest and you say, I have sinned this and this, and then the, sin says, uh, the priest says, yes, God has forgiven you. And before you leave, you have to give them, of course, some money. Yeah? I don't know if it still happens. I'm told it does. I don't know. But it used to be practiced quite widely. Because people, what, they, they say, okay, you know, I need, to, I need to speak. I've done something wrong. I need to tell someone. 
And this is often what happens today. When we've committed something serious, we feel we need to speak to the closest person to us. I wonder for us, who's the closest, God or human beings? Who do we open up first to? And of course, the invitation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is open up to me and I will sort it out for you if it's for your own benefit. Yeah? So this need for ibadah comes from the, what? The intrinsic uh, desire to communicate. And finally, it is about the fact that we need ibadah because throughout our lives we accumulate so much pollution and dirt. And our hearts get contaminated with actions and sins. And the only way they could be cleansed is through worship of God. The only way they could be kind of eradicated and made in the best possible way for the receiving of God's mercy is through what? Is through ibadah. And that's why the Quran says, Allah bi dhikrillahi. This heart which needs to be looked after and purified can only be achieved through what? Submission and total obedience and worship of the divine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, Musa alayhi salam is told, O oh Musa, fa'budni because you need it. And imagine, next time we stand before Allah in salah and intrinsically and consciously we believe that we need it. Without it, we will not survive. The Quran says there are dead men and women walking. Quran says, and redefines the concept of life and death. Yes? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who are believers, those who are true worshippers are alive. Those whose hearts are sealed and have abandoned the association with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're dead but they're just walking as flesh. So the message that the Quran uh, wants to instill in us is the need to rethink about our attitude towards ibadah, how we approach these acts of obligation and in what way we reflect upon them and in how we conduct them as well. But of course, the greatest manifestation of this ibadah is salah. That's why it says, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ Lidhikri, which insha'Allah ta'ala will be discussed in detail next time. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallillahum ala sayyid al-mursaleen Muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.